Africa will be swallowed by the culture of death that has already claimed North America and Europe. The plight of the African people is so urgent because this is one of the very few areas of the world that's still completely pro-life. The people have a pro-life culture, even if they're not Christians, their culture is very traditional and family-oriented. They have intact marriages and families, so they have a totally pro-life culture which the anti-life forces of the world want to break down. But thanks to the work of Human Life International, anything they may have broken down is being rebuilt and the people are getting the tools they need to strengthen themselves against the next wave of attack. HLI's work in Africa uh, counteracts this anti-life onslaught in a couple of ways. First of all, we always have to keep in mind that when people try to bring abortion into a culture, they never do it through a popular referendum. The people simply do not want abortion. It's always an elite group usually operating under coercion from international organizations like IPPF and the United Nations that imposes abortion on a culture. It's never asked for by the people. So what HLI does down there in the several countries that we're working is to try to gain popular support for the idea that the marriages and families have to be protected from this intrusion from the West. Most of our work in the different countries in East and West and South Africa is geared towards educating people about how the tactics of the anti-lifers are being worked already in their governments and in their institutions to impose abortion on them. And then we educate people about the value of marriage and family and God's plan. Perhaps no one understands the anti-life mentality better than Brian Close, who has spent over a decade researching their means and methods in order to arm pro-life activists in a fight against them. I've been a member of Human Life International for a little more than 10 years now. Uh, my job is research and training at Human Life International, so I research the technical and the theological questions and do pro-life training all around the world. To understand the veracity with which the pro-death movement targets the third world, it is necessary to be familiar with the philosophies driving their agenda. To that end, Human Life International has done extensive research into eugenics, a method proposing the improvement of humanity by permitting only the reproduction of superior classes. Eugenics is a driving force behind such groups as Planned Parenthood. Eugenics is the science of breeding a better human race. And we've always had eugenics uh, back to the Romans and the Greeks who exposed effective and unwanted newborn babies uh, on up to the modern day. Darwin and Malthus and others have given us the modern eugenics movement, which was carried on by Planned Parenthood Federation of America, Margaret Sanger, and even Adolf Hitler. Eugenics plays a huge role in the way that the West approaches Africa, because the year after America legalized abortion in 1973, in 74, we began an official population control policy for the uh, poorer countries of the world. This policy is known as the Kissinger Report, and basically all of American foreign policy still operates under the dominance of that mentality that was codified there in the Kissinger Report, which says that we have to keep the populations of these countries down in order for us to benefit and to maintain our prosperity, our economic prosperity, because we need materials from these countries, and in order for us to maintain our political dominance over them. And the fact of the matter is that when the overpopulation doctrine is preached around the world, nobody ever asks if America is overpopulated or if Europe is overpopulated. They always stigmatize the third world and the peoples of color and say that those people are overpopulated. And therefore, we're dealing with a racist, eugenicist mentality. But how was this mentality born? Who were the initial proponents of such a philosophy? In the United States, it was spread by the organization that would eventually become known as Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood Federation of America started out as the American Birth Control League, or the ABCL, which was founded by Margaret Sanger in the 1920s. Right now in the United States, it has a budget of nearly a billion dollars. It runs the largest chain of abortion clinics in the world. Planned Parenthood has undergone a series of name and leadership changes. But one thing that has not changed is its mission of population control, a mission which can be traced all the way back to the group's foundress, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was born into a large Catholic family, had a number of brothers and sisters, and she 
allegedly first began to show concern for the poor when she spent some time as a nurse among the poor in New York City, and she saw the poverty among large families there. But she fell into the mistake of, instead of trying to improve the situation of these families, she set about making large poor families into small poor families, which is just what the population controllers do today. She was a primary crusader for birth control in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s. First she published a little pamphlet called The Woman Rebel, and then she started publishing the Birth Control Review, which ran for a little over 25 years. What she wanted to do was to create a race of thoroughbred human beings, and that was actually the masthead of the Birth Control League of America for quite a few years, and the Birth Control Review, to create a race of thoroughbreds. And she would do this primarily by holding down the populations of the poor and the immigrants and encouraging the richer classes, the better educated and bred classes, to have more children. A race of thoroughbreds. The Birth Control Review, which proudly bore this credo, gave voice to many a noted racist of the time and to many whose influence would be felt in the atrocities of Nazi Germany. Some of the people who wrote for Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Review are very interesting characters. One was Ernst Rudan, who founded and operated the Society for Racial Hygiene in Hitler's Nazi Germany, he was responsible for designing the program that wiped out the Jews in Germany. A second person we should look at is Lothrop Stoddard, who wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, and you can find this book on racist websites today. And what Stoddard said was that upon the quality of life all else depends, and what we have to do is we have to hold down the Negro population, as he called it, because if any other people cross with the Negro, the whites or the uh, Indians or the Asians, then they're pretty much vanquished as a race. Some of these ideas may seem like merely the lunatic ravings of an archaic and long-dead worldview, but the statistics indicate that Planned Parenthood is carrying out these racist policies even today. Well, it's interesting to look at the percentage of the races that have been wiped out by abortion in the United States. If you look at the white race, about 9.5% have been aborted. If you look at African American race, more than one quarter, close to 30% have been aborted. And this is because if you look at a city with a high minority population like Washington, D.C. or Detroit, they have five times as many abortion clinics per million people as a low minority city like Seattle or Portland, Oregon. Now we've documented at Human Life International the deaths of some 360 women due to so-called safe and legal abortion, and 68% of those killed were minority women. Even though minority women get a smaller amount of abortions in absolute numbers than white women, about 40%. So what we're talking about here is that minority women, when they go in and get an abortion, are three or four times more likely to die than white women. And I believe that this excessive inattention to detail by the abortionists to women of color constitutes direct racism. They're killing them by the hundreds in the United States, as well, of course, as their unborn babies. While the statistics provide chilling evidence for a racist and eugenicist agenda of population control in the United States, does the same hold true for such efforts in Africa? Is there even a correlation between the pro-death movement in North America and similar efforts abroad? There's a strict correlation between what was done in the United States in the 20th century and what is happening now. There's just sort of an echo effect. They are further behind economically than we are, so it's harder for these same things to take place in another society, and there's a delay. Now, in the poorer countries of the world, they're not quite yet at abortion, although some countries have legalized it, but primarily they're still working on them in the contraceptive realm and in the sex education realm. Because what these two things do is they break down all the stereotypes, they break down the taboos that people naturally have surrounding human sexuality, and they open people up to the whole idea of killing babies for convenience.